No Limit Kids. How Working Parents Coach Their Young Kids to Become Wealthy Adults. 1,000 Parents Surveyed. Ideal Guide for Kids Under 10. By Dash Adedipe. Introduction. Research shows most kids grow up to become financially poor adults whilst few others become wealthy. Nothing breaks my heart more than the sight of a helpless poor child, but it is even worse if that child becomes an adult and still has no clue how to beat the vicious circle of poverty. Most parents do understand the basics of money. Research has shown that over 79% of parents would love to teach their children about money and wealth, but are worried that they are inadequate to do so, mainly because quite a lot of parents themselves suffer from poor financial confidence. Worryingly, as a society, we struggle with record amounts of debt, less repayments and increasing personal debt against real-time income. Therefore, money becomes an uncomfortable subject to discuss with our kids. Parents that are struggling with financial confidence aren't good with managing their finances in the first place. Hence, they are hesitant to talk about good financial management with their children, inadvertently leaving this to their children to figure out themselves when they become adults. Our children's opportunity to become financially successful in future as adults depend on our ability to provide early opportunities for them to learn, develop, and strengthen their core life skills about good money management and financial literacy. It is our sole responsibility to take action now and guide our children into a future of financial security. As parents we all want to leave a great legacy for our children to build upon. As the saying goes, it's not what you leave for your children, but what you leave in your children. Children's money habit begins to form as early as five years old, so it's a great idea to start early. Parenthood is one of life's great adventures and most parents genuinely want their children to grow up and do amazing things with their lives, to become model citizens and become a great source of joy and pride to themselves and society at large. Coaching our children about the ways of the world all through kindergarten through their teenage years and beyond comes along with its own super roller coaster of experiences and emotions, but it is definitely worth it. In this book, readers will learn and share stories about simple yet effective financial strategies that are grounded in patient coaching solutions that can support our young children in their daily lives. Readers will also become aware of the value of coaching children early in the understanding of good financial management and empowering them to become wealthy adults of the future with no limits. After the horrible global pandemic of 2020, this book was written as a dedication to all the parents who passed away. Also, to one of my childhood friends, OJA who passed away a few years ago leaving behind two very young children and partner. A stark reminder of how short life on earth can sometimes be. He was an awesome fellow, very lighthearted, full of cheer and laughter. We referred to him as OJA, a term which means market, because he had a knack of being very resourceful when required. Unfortunately, he was still finding his way through life and had not yet harnessed the abundance of the universe nor had enough time with his children to begin preparing them for their future. After his passing over to the great beyond, I've always anticipated channeling that grief into a productive route for parents with young children. Chapter 1. Happiness comes before wealth. Happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence, Aristotle. No one can match the level of influence parents have on their children. As parents, we play a huge part in helping to shape the lives and financial future of our children from an early age. Our actions and behaviors are being mimicked and subtly stored into their subconscious for later use. Happy parents are more likely to have happy children and the benefits of happiness in our lives simply cannot be overstated. True happiness is the highest level of success. Being happy helps us live longer. Happiness boosts our immune systems, it gives us greater ability to deal with stress and it positively affects our overall well-being and how we deal with others that we come in contact with. As parents, to be good coaches to our children, we should endeavor to fill our lives with happiness and happy moments. Happy parents always engage positively with their children, they are open-hearted to positively influence their children's behavior. So which emotional experiences should we go in search of to achieve happiness in our lives? Aristotle believed that the true enrichment of the human life comes from happiness. And to achieve a life full of happiness and bloom, we need to consciously make the right choices, and this involves keeping our eye on the future, or on the ultimate result we want for our lives as a whole. 
We will not achieve happiness simply by enjoying the pleasures of the moment, short term. Happiness is a goal we proactively work towards. It requires positive action and is not a temporary emotional state. Whilst in this book we would be discussing how to enrich our kids through coaching to become wealthy adults, knowing that happiness is the shortcut to anything we want in life, and understanding that feeling happy is the fastest way to bring wealth into our life. Permanent happiness comes from various means such as giving, volunteering, being grateful, listening to music that moves you, and lower stress levels. Remember, the last time you were genuinely happy, everyone around you felt the joy of your company, your interaction was more engaging, and you were fun to be around. The mental shift towards happiness brings with it your capacity for inner peace and a vibe of confidence and positive glow. Your happiness rubs off on your children, it also improves your empathy and puts you in an awesome emotional state to see things more clearly. When we are happy, we fall into our bubble that can make anything happen. We have our own zen and creative sparks that appear from everywhere and your reaction to events are peaceful and divine. Happiness is easy when we let go of the things that don't matter. Summary Happy children are full of energy, bounce and eagerness to learn. As parents we can transcend our vibes across to our children. We must always take the lead, as kids would often pick up on cues. Most children thrive in stable and nurturing environments where they have a routine and know what to expect. In a great way, this can help their learning, their confidence and self-growth leading them on the way to successful adulthood. As we say, happiness is an inside job. Chapter 2 Practical Ways to Achieve Happiness The best way to make children good is to make them happy, Oscar Wilde. Giving. Have you ever noticed how giving others a helping hand makes you feel better? Research also shows that this has an effect on our body, brain and aids mental wellness. Helping others has a way of releasing the feel-good endorphins which instinctively motivates us to do even better. This can help us to lower stress level, activate joy from within and purposeful happiness. Help a stranger, be kind to your neighbors and colleagues. The more happiness you bring to others, the happier you will be. Music A peaceful or motivated state of mind can be created or influenced through various means such as listening to good soulful music or music that sets your pulse racing. Listening to good music helps to actively cultivate a source of peace and happiness from your inner being. When we listen to music that moves us, our brain releases dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that plays a major role in how we feel pleasure. It also helps us to focus, go an extra step and find things interesting. Ever been to a spin class? It can be a tough cardio experience for beginners. Despite how intense spin classes can often be, my spinning instructor literally always has no empty seats in his evening spin class because he carefully selects a range of upbeat and feel-good music that gets his members motivated and going the extra mile. The dopamine effect aids the release of blood flow to regions of the brain involved in surges that increasing heart rates, improves our mood and also decrease stress levels. Focusing on our happiness goal. This involves taking ownership of our happiness which means that we would have to stop outsourcing our happiness, blaming external circumstances or people by laying blame at the door of others for our unhappiness. Using some of the steps above to reclaim our power, we can then begin letting go of anger. As we already know, anger often leads to bitterness and bitterness only causes resentment. Anger is also a very heavy burden to carry. We can begin to let it go by using tools like walking amongst nature or open fields of greenery, concentrating on a peaceful and positive state of mind, yoga or even focus on helping someone else, as this can pull us away from our self-preoccupation. Regular exercise Regular exercise helps us to refresh our mind and body. Numerous studies show the benefits of regular exercise. Exercise has a very profound effect on our happiness and can also be used to alleviate anxiety, or as part of a strategy to manage symptoms of depression. Exercise also benefits everyone from kids to older folks. It helps to reduce stress and boosts our ability to deal with pre-existing mental tension. It can also help us to relax, increase our brain power, and even improve our body image by boosting self-esteem and improving our positive self-image. Exercise from a young age stimulates the development of our children's muscles, 
bones and joints, as well as our heart and lungs while helping children to maintain a healthy weight. Children should aim for at least one hour of physical activity per day. As working parents, we can create a weekend routine where we visit the local park or greenfields with our kids for a run around and family exercise session. Social time. Spending good social time with our friends and family is very valuable when it comes to improving our overall happiness. Humans are social creatures and thrive off close and genuine relationships with others. People with more supportive families and friends have been known to be generally happier people. The quality of our close relationships has an effect on our happiness barometer. Several studies have also found that time spent with friends we like and have strong relationships with makes a big difference to how happy we feel. In addition, children with a good network of friends, family and connections grow up having more positive experience, a sense of personal significance and become happier adults. A happy life is much more about making friends for kids. Healthy eating habits. Even as adults we require good healthy eating habits to be at full optimum performance and in great shape. Kids are no different, children require a balanced diet that consists of carbohydrates, calcium, protein, vegetables and fats. Let's be honest, fast foods can be a quick fix sometimes, but parents should limit the consumption of junk food for their children. Eating meals including sugary drinks, sweets, and other junk foods shouldn't be classed as part of their balanced diet and we should instead focus more on healthy eating. Summary Raising children to become wealthy adults involves painting a clear visual picture in their mind today and educating them about tools that they start using to become wealthy adults. They cannot help the poor in the future if they become one of them. Chapter 3 a letter to my young kid about life and money. Hey kiddo. The world can truly be beautiful and filled with warmth, and rays of beautiful sunshine all pouring upon your uniqueness. In this world we know, each of us arrived individually, we have been given the mortal blessing to explore and experience all that the earth has to offer and more. For generations, we humans have tried to understand the meaning of our existence, understand our purpose, define our norms, inked our laws and conform to our understanding of what is expected of humans. But does anyone truly know the greatness and power each of us carries within? Our total existence is defined by time and it could sometimes feel like a dream all along. So, I write to you dear kiddo, conformity leads to the limitation of the human mind. Be radically brilliant whilst you explore your greatness within. Our mindset internally defines our outcomes externally so, be still. Pay attention to your intuition and let it guide your endeavors because ultimately, who is right or wrong? What was right in previous years is no longer acceptable in the modern day, as we move and evolve with time, so does our desires, motivations and actions. So, stand guard at the door of your mind and let your inner star be your guide always. Define your meaning to life, remain inquisitive, question everything. Be open and don't be afraid to take risks whilst remaining focused on your goals and always believe that you can achieve all that you aspire to be in life. Above all, be kind and value yourself. It's inevitable that you will make mistakes, we all do, but on the other side lies a potential boost in self-confidence and self-esteem because you will be empowered to find your solutions. Try as much as possible to be self-sufficient and avoid following a follower, be your own person. Money-wise. Remember that money is only a tool you will use for the rest of your life. Handle money in a competent manner. Learn about it. Attract it and master it. Spend less than you make and always have a plan for your money. Never invest in anything you don't totally understand. Own property. Give to charities. Travel frequently to broaden your view and learn from other cultures. Save for your future. Have an emergency fund and always pay yourself first. Flowing from the foregoing. Don't forget to live an awesome life and always remember that being alive is a miracle. You're healthy, strong and able to love, laugh and smile. You made the 1 in 400 trillion odds to be here. So, be the best you can possibly be every single day. Your loving dad. Chapter 4. Sally's Advantage. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men, Frederick Douglass. Sally was born in Ghana, West Africa and throughout her early childhood, her mom was a full-time worker and homemaker. 
Her parents survived financially because her mom took up various jobs at their local canteen to prop up her dad's income. Her dad worked part-time as a maths teacher at a local school whilst he was also hoping to be able to attend university. They were far from comfortable, neither could they be classed as poor because they at least had enough to eat but, any signs of money worries were rarely ever discussed. Her parents were both hard workers so, she rarely saw her parents idle as they worked around each other. Her neighborhood was rough, fraught with petty crime, broken guttering, filthy windows, poor paintwork and nighttime tunes from mosquitoes but, growing up as a kid she couldn't even tell if her family were poor or not. Looking back, she believes her parents' mindset would never have allowed them to admit that they were poor. One thing she remembers very fondly from her childhood was how happy she was at home, her dad's evening and weekend teachings on numbers, learning how to budget and also how to be a cheerful giver. This was aimed towards being of great use to her later in life. Despite her parents being relatively poor, her dad had access to his local school's library so, she was kept occupied reading quite a few books from an early age. In addition, her parents always advocated the basic fundamentals of a good education, always being happy, being prudent with money, savings, and more pertinently a quote which hung on their living room wall, always stuck. Her father always quoted James Allen, as a man thinketh. A man is not rightly conditioned until he is a happy, healthy, and prosperous being, and happiness, health, and prosperity are the result of a harmonious adjustment of the inner with the outer of the man with his surroundings. Whilst Sally was living in a less developed country back in the late 60s, her dad always dreamed of becoming a university graduate and her mom filled her with beliefs that as long as she was happy, excelled at school, focused on her studies and got herself a good job which she loved in the future, she would one day improve her station in life. Her parents persisted with working diligently in their modest way. Sally's mom barely had any formal education past her primary education hence, she worked at the local canteen six days a week. At the age of nine, Sally usually would get her schoolwork completed at the back of the canteen after school and waited at tables to clear up after customers finished their meals. Her parents were determined to give her the best start in life particularly because of enormous barriers to education in Africa which was particularly prevalent for girls so. Her dad filled her books with assignments to keep her occupied. Over the weekend she was made to count and put her little earning or tips from the local canteen into her little rusty piggy bank made from a powdered milk can. Despite working for long and ridiculous hours to support their family, her father filled the house with laughter, quirky jokes, fun and random maths questions after dinner. On the weekends the family had a clear schedule, they exercised in the mornings and played Monopoly in their back garden in the afternoon before being permitted to play with neighboring kids in the evening. At 19, Sally's diligence with her schoolwork eventually paid off, as she won a government scholarship award to study in England. Her parents' combined yearly savings was barely enough to purchase her a one-way ticket to England to attend university. And despite the difficulty her parents went through to support her dreams, her dedication towards her studies paid off and made her a success in university. She thoroughly enjoyed the learning process as it was nothing compared to what she had been used to. She says, I can remember feeling very privileged to be amongst students from a variety of background and feeling inspired that if I persisted and focus on my purpose here, I would be successful. Sally studied nursing full-time and also worked part-time three days a week. A few years after graduation, Sally got married to her husband James and they have two kids. Both parents were working most days, with no external family connections. Sally worked 12-hour shifts, five days a week as an office administrator and nurse. She thought upon arriving in the UK she would immediately cross the divide across the vicious cycle of poverty into a free-flowing society filled with opportunities, advancement and the ability to get rich but she was surprised to realize that both the rich and the poor lived side by side and location wasn't the only factor involved in getting rich but she was determined and harbored dreams of becoming a wealthy adult. Determined to change her lot and not go through the same experience of her parents, she persisted with her education. After earning her nursing degree, she worked for the National Health Service in England, she loved the humanitarian side of the health service, and also volunteered with numerous charities assisting young children. Ultimately, she retained a very strong desire to become wealthy because she also felt incredibly good when giving to others, as it gave her greater happiness than spending on herself, but she didn't know how. 
even though she was good with her finances and has always been a prudent saver like her parents taught her. The numbers didn't add up, she says. Considering her wages and savings alone, it would take her a further 30 years to become a millionaire. While on break one evening during her night shift at her local hospital she accidentally stumbled across a book that had been left behind on the canteen table called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. It was a shock to her system and it sent shivers through her spine as it was the book her dad had coined his favorite phrase from. After digesting the entire content in just over 48 hours, she shared her revelation of a quote which stuck with her to her husband James. The vision that you glorify in your mind, the ideal that you enthrone in your heart, this you will build your life by, this you will become. Within weeks, Sally and James started thinking of a variety of ideas for an extra income to elevate their financial station, create an atmosphere for more family time and her charitable contributions. They began flirting with the idea of starting their own business, from running a care home to running a child nursery, and then a colleague suggested that they should start an African grocery store due to Sally always speaking of missing her mom's food back home in Ghana. She realized that her African background wasn't an obstacle after all and would instead tap into her uniqueness of experience of both cultures and use that as an asset in business. After much research, Sally ventured into importing Afro-Caribbean food stock to London. The first couple of years was tight on their budget as she still had to work her night shifts and wages from her job was being used for importing stocks, while James used his wages for rent and the family upkeep. Sally approached her local bank on six separate occasions for a business loan. The bank kept declining her applications because she had no assets. Determined to be a success and not blame circumstance, she approached her colleagues and church minister to stand as a guarantor for her before the bank finally granted her a small business loan. A few years later, once her business began to grow, Sally switched from her nursing career and focused on her business full-time. By 1997, she became a millionaire and a high-end Afro-Caribbean food importer with two distribution centers across the capital. Business had grown so much that she had to move the first store from its 3,000-square-foot space to a 10,000-square-foot standalone building. Sally states as regards her success, there are so many elements but believes that her road to success began with her foundation as a kid. Always being optimistic, tenacious, happy, expecting the best always helping others and having a strong desire to transform her life. Her fundamental teachings from her parents also included buying only what you need still plays a part in her daily decisions. Even though her parents' circumstances weren't ideal, Sally grew up happy and started to grow by becoming self-made in her mind first. Changing her story from poor to rich. She stated, All you need is to change your self-concept. If you certainly know today that you are poor, you must renounce that idea and start believing that you are rich even if you are totally broke. Immersing herself in good thoughts and experience in finding herself whilst being able to help others and as such enriching herself. She also fully funded her dad's university degree. As a mom, Sally is raising her kids the right way in the right environment. She tells them stories about her financial childhood thereby teaching them not to take things for granted while stating that being poor previously gave her respect for the value of money and taught her how not to waste it. While she is often tempted to provide her children all she didn't have growing up she keeps them grounded with the right fundamentals that is. Earn before you spend. Though it's hard to accept sometimes, she states that her children need to be able to deal with minor setbacks and be creative thinkers by adapting and adjusting to different conditions. Our children have to learn to conquer their problems without their parents stepping in all the time. That way, they are anchored and better able than those who have never faced them. So, our task is not to eliminate every challenge our child faces. Rather, we provide them the tools with which to handle the inevitable pressures of life when they become adults. Summary Children who grow up in poor, stressful and unhealthy environments like in a family that struggles to afford basic necessities or neighborhoods with violence can often see those issues influence their behaviors. But not all poor children should have poor adult outcomes. Parents could invest in their own happiness and can start by beginning to trust their own positive instincts. Led with an open heart without letting others or external events ruin your day. Do more of the things that bring you joy and love. Love yourself and this would flow through the kids. We may also directly transfer our wealth to our children via inheritance, 
but the purpose here is to equip them for the future regardless of our current financial circumstance. Some key areas we can work on includes children's initiative, children's income, children's financial literacy, and purposeful transfer of wealth from parents. Chapter 5. The Positive Impact of Wealth on Kids. The only wealth in this world is children, more than all the money, power on earth. Mario Puzo. Wealth education begins at home and school as just a tiny part of a kid's education. Wealth has various definitions depending on your viewing lens, but it can be simply described as a vital component of any economy. Wealth may mean seeking deeper relationships, personal growth, or creating more meaning in life whilst possessing the ability to enjoy the ordinary pleasures of life. For the purpose of this book, we refer to the term wealth as a source of finance for future use, for freedom, particularly in carrying out our daily functions and in retirement, also for reducing our vulnerability to economic and personal shocks such as unemployment, ill health, or natural health disasters that is the pandemic of 2020. Wealth also increases our opportunities for entrepreneurial activities. It increases our available options and offers freedom from numerous restrictions in society. The highest dividend money can pay us is the ability to control our time. Wealth aids free thinking. If parents don't coach their children about money and wealth, who do we expect to coach them? The school of hard knocks. Hopefully not. Wealth education begins at home and planning to raise our children to become wealthy adults isn't just about money. It's also about financial freedom, money management and fiscal responsibility whilst raising our children to grow up to become self-sufficient adults that thrive in the real world. For parents who haven't made their desired financial impact yet, this is even more imperative as the only way we can combat this great financial plague and help ensure our younger generations don't continue to struggle is to coach them from a young age about the right way to become wealthy. It is important we explain to our kids why and how we plan to achieve this. Just like Sally, there is hope as many low-income families have raised children that have ended up becoming wealthy adults. Let's look at some facts. Research show. Some children of wealthy parents tend to fare much better financially when they become adults compared to children of poorer parents. Children with wealthy parents are more likely to be successful adults than even intellectually gifted kids born to low-income families due to a variety of external factors. It would seem starting off in life with or without family wealth could shape our lives forever. Statistical facts have also shown that a family's financial resources are quite important for children's future financial outcome. So, it seems parents' financial status can really help their children to become a financially stable adult. It would be simplistic to assume the reason for this is because wealth is simply passed from one generation to the other in the form of inheritance or family gifts. Hence, making it easier for children of wealthy parents to become wealthy as well. But there's more to it than just the passing of wealth as inheritance. So, why do children from wealthy families tend to have better financial outcomes as adults? Children born into a high-income earning family would normally have more access to tools and resources required for their self-improvement, development and wealth. Their environment sets them up for success compared to lower-income children. Furthermore, factors such as parents passing on their abilities, character, selection preferences, savings behavior, financial risk habits, accumulation of wealth, financial risk-taking, savings propensity, Parental investments that promotes their children's human capital and earnings capacity all depends on the actions of their parents including the conscious impartation of traits that influence their children. Summary. Instead of buying your children all the things you never had, you should teach them all the things you were never thought. Bruce Lee. Chapter 6. Outcome on Poor Kids. A big hole in a poor child's shoe is the simplest evidence to condemn the society he lives in. Mehmet Ilden. According to behavioral economist, Professor Susan E. Mayer, poor children are more likely to impose costs on society by actually requiring more health facilities, more education resources, and more government economic aid, benefits. Because their chances of success are lower, they are also more likely to grow up to be poor themselves, thus perpetuating poverty into the next generation, continuing a cycle of poverty. A U.S. research study conducted through the Urban Institute's Low Income Working Families Project by Caroline Ratcliffe, it was found that one in every five children currently lives in poverty, 
but nearly twice as many experience poverty at some point during their childhood. The poor children were found to be less successful than their richer counterparts in both their educational achievement and employment prospects, and the poor kids were more likely to have some involvement with the criminal justice system in later years. Furthermore, the research also shows, 93% of well-to-do children completed their high school, while only 64% of persistently poorer children were able to do so. A large deficit also exists further when we include their family and neighborhood characteristics. This disadvantage can erode the poor kids' future employment prospects and wages throughout a lifetime. Some of the family characteristics discovered also shows that the parents' education relates to children's academic achievement, for example, poor children whose parents have more than a high school education are 30% more likely to complete high school and almost five times more likely to complete university than poor children whose parents did not complete high school. It's a vicious cycle for kids who by no fault of theirs have been born into poor families. Focusing on the positives, parents who coach their children to be financially successful set their children up on one of the most crucial paths to be happy and successful in life. They would have provided their children with the tools to make independent and informed decisions about their finances in the future. If most parents take time to coach their children the important aspects of money and demonstrate to them good financial habits, then it is very likely that their child will grow up with the essential tools of financial education. But if the parents have no idea about their personal finances, it's no surprise, neither will their kids. I suppose a backup plan for a lot of parents, if we can call it that, has always been to get their kids a good education and the rest is up to the kids to figure out when they become adults but not realizing that our kids observe us when we work, talk and even how we spend. I've met a few adults with good careers and jobs, genuinely good people but who also lack basic financial education. Hence, despite their earnings, they remain thousands of miles away from financial freedom. Education is a great tool that has to be used. But school education is not a guarantee for future wealth creation. How many poor graduates do you know? So, what's the point of having a good college or university education but end up working for many decades and not becoming wealthy? Sally's parents worked hard and saved all the money they could to ensure that she could get off to a good start in life with a good education, but their only focus was to teach her to be successful in school. How many of our colleagues were successful kids at school but haven't been able to transform that educational success into real-life wealth? Financial coach and author of Money is Emotional, Christine Lucan stated, Most of us have money narratives from our childhood years, which colors our present financial behaviors. As young children, we tend to internalize everything our parents tell us as the truth, and this includes what they say about money. Kids learn their behavior by what goes on around them. It gets even deeper as in some cases, some children whom their parents never talked about money and racked up credit card debts, might unwittingly follow suit. When they reach adulthood, these practices become so ingrained that they might not even think to question them. They just accept the fact that they're bad savers or impulsive spender without considering why that might be. As parents, can we begin to consciously change the narrative for our kids and start modeling good financial behaviors? Summary. The relationship we have with our children is the most important element of parenting. It is the value of our connection that determines how well they listen to us, accept our coaching methods, expectations and values, and cooperation with us. Make money coaching fun. Spending money with our kids should be fun. Let's ensure that they understand money is meant to be used for good and to benefit our lives with good planning. Sally's money mindset from a young age was having a bittersweet relationship with money because she had to save in her piggy bank all she earned during the week but once a month she was provided with little treats by her dad. Their conversations about the disciplines of not spending all she owned was always a talking point though. As an adult, she now realizes how hard her parents had to work. Despite their low stations, she was being taught how to manage her finances and to appreciate the value of money and everything she had. Chapter 7. The Money Talk. A young child is a blank canvas and will absorb what you teach them and take it into adulthood. A blank canvas. A plain board with no content upon which one can easily impose one's impressions and point of view. This can then be developed in a variety of ways but mainly based on the input received. What children see and learn about money and wealth in their childhood will influence how they manage their money as adults. 
Kids who learn about money early on develop better financial habits as adults. These children also tend to have less debt and higher net worths when they become adults. To be able to manage their finances well, children need to observe, talk about and experience using money on a regular basis while growing up. Furthermore, it's important to note that financial literacy is not a side effect of wealth. Wealth is actually a side effect of financial literacy. Money talk. If children are raised in households filled with negative reminders about lack and limited resources or criticisms of the rich and wealthy, they will most likely carry this beliefs and behaviors into adulthood. Children don't have a full understanding in the beginning, it takes time. So please be patient whilst coaching. Money shouldn't be off your home discussions. Introduce your kids to the money conversations early. A lot of parents talk about most things with their kids except having the regular positive money talk. You might also think that wealthy parents would share their financial know-how with their offsprings, but that's not necessarily the case. Even amongst adults, we tend not to feel comfortable speaking with our friends or family about money. It's almost a taboo subject to talk about. We are scared to talk about our finances even with people we care about. As humans, we feel we would be judged when we disclose our true financial state with our peers. UK firm Lowell Financial commissioned a study which revealed that people in the UK find it much easier to discuss their mental health than talking about money. The survey of 2,000 UK adults revealed what is and isn't considered socially acceptable to talk about, with 25% of respondents believing conversation about personal finances to be a no-go, as it makes them feel anxious and nervous. One in five people also don't think it's suitable to disclose their salary in social settings while the majority would not talk about the subject of money at work. Money is still seen as a taboo topic in the UK. A separate study also found that a quarter of British adults have lied about their personal financial situation to family or friends, with 11% revealing that they have lied to their partner about how much debt they have. Another 23% said that they have misled their partner about finances, while 37% have had arguments about money with their partners. Traditionally, most adults have grown up learning it was uncool to talk about topics like money, race, politics and sex. You just don't talk about money. You don't share details of your salary with your friends or loved ones. You try not to ask your friends about theirs either. We're discouraged from talking about money. Even up to a few years ago, companies in Britain could discipline their staffs for talking about their salary. But, in the course of wanting to fix your financial situation, or even learn new skills to improve your financial literacy, talking about it is necessary. There are very few financial problems that can be improved by ignoring or neglecting them. So, who is looking out for us when our money affairs aren't in order? Speaking about money might actually help us to lift the inconvenient burden. It can be initially hard for us to talk about money as we may be worried that we won't be taken seriously, or our mythical financial security buffer would finally be exposed. We might also be worried about people judging us by our large or tiny bank balance. I'm not advocating that we disclose our personal finances with every single person we meet, but by being honest and open, we might actually help each other to achieve our money and wealth goals. If we are intimidated by our personal finances and unsure of where to start, we can begin by speaking to someone we trust or financially savvy people about money. This can certainly help us to see the situation from a different angle. It can help us to look at issues that we have with money in a new or different way. It can help us to release built-up tension and this can help us to gain new insight into the situation that is causing the problems and it can also help identify options or solutions. Let's get talking. During research for this book, we surveyed over 1,000 parents about their correspondence with their children with regards money talk. Results show that parents are becoming more aware that it is imperative to get their young children financially literate. Whilst I understand financial bias is a real problem, on a personal note, I learn a lot when talking about wealth with like-minded colleagues, you'd be surprised what ideas and strategies you could pick up by having intellectual discussions. We share practical and intellectual ideas on long-term wealth creation or growth. The idea here is simple. We should continue learning to enable us to invest in our children's human capital. If parents are comfortable about having open conversations about money, we can start transmitting this across in a healthy way to our children therefore increasing their financial capability, confidence, and their ability to properly manage money daily.
Our children can become financially savvy and successful adults with high levels of self-esteem and self-worth by the foundations we help them lay. Children enjoy learning new things and being with those they love. A combination of both is a win. Summary. Children begin soaking up information from a young age and their success in future depends on how they can articulate and use their accumulated knowledge. To conquer the taboo about money and help our kids overcome this, we should start at home by communicating with them on the money subject. In addition to taking financial advice from a good financial advisor, join groups of like-minded professionals, get comfortable talking about money. After all, money itself has no value, it's just a tool used to achieve meaningful goals. Chapter 8. My First Money Lesson. Friends are forever until they borrow money from you. My first money lesson came during my days in boarding school. Growing up I had not really been taught anything much about money, I had seen it a few times, picked up a few notes from my parents to purchase a few items from the sweet store but I didn't really have any real relationship with money. All the money I picked up from relatives at Christmas were saved to purchase fireworks or sweets. Fast forward a few years later, the D-Day finally arrived, I was 10 my first day at boarding school and my first stint away from home by myself without my family. It was my first time away from my siblings, so I had my bags all packed and ready to go into my dormitory, then my mom gave me 200 naira equivalent of 10 British pound back then. It was supposed to be my pocket money for my first term. I slid the notes into my textbook and said goodbye. Secondary school was fun, the excitement of being away from home spurred me on and meeting other new students was so exciting. It was a military-themed boarding school, so it was quite regimented. Fixed time to wake up, breakfast, lunch and dinner was provided by the school albeit it had to be shared across 10 students. Five students sat across each other in the dining hall. The school taught me many things from being disciplined to becoming very independent and responsible. It also brought its many harsh realities that accompanied a military base environment. As junior students, we literally had to take orders from the senior students, from having their clothes ironed to running their bathwater. It was tough initially, but in due time most of us adapted. Those that didn't left the school sooner or later. During our evening breaks, most junior students trooped to the school cafeteria with their newly acquainted friends to purchase a few perks, it was mostly biscuits, sausage rolls and flavored juice. I still had my N200 stashed in my textbook stored within the confines of my dormitory locker. A week had just passed and one of my new friends Michael approached me stating that he had no money and asked if I would be kind enough to lend him some of my money. I literally emptied my little cash stash and gave him half of my money without even asking the basic questions like how I was going to get paid back or where he was going to get money from to refund me considering that we were locked away in a boarding school with no access to the world for at least three months. As you can imagine, I never got the money back and for the remaining eight weeks I had to go hungry during our evening breaks. Harsh lesson learned but by the next term, I knew better to safeguard my finances from avoidable loss. Summary Coaching our children on financial literacy can help them to learning and avoid money mistakes that we've made as parents. If they must lend money to a family member or friend, they should treat it as a business and provide them with a timeline and schedule for repaying the loan back. A good idea might also be to consider adding interest to the loan if they must lend to their friends or family. This stops the revolving door of friends lending. Whilst friends and family might be initially disappointed, it is better than ruining the relationship. Don't lend to friends or family if you can't afford to write off the money. Chapter 9 5-Step Strategy for Coaching Children to Become Financially Wealthy Adults C-H-I-L-D C. Coaching Kids on Money Activities H. Helping Our Kids Unlock Their Potential I. Invest L. Learning D. Debt The best coach in the world for the job is almost always our parents. As children, our parents can help us to reach our potential considering the fact that they know us better than most people do. They can help us uncover our goals by working towards them together. As kids, we tend to have numerous goals that can't often be compartmentalized from owning a new toy, learning to swim, riding a bike, doing well in gymnastics or playing football like Messi. Coaches, in this case, 
Parents can help kids to effectively develop their skills and get laser focused on their strengths, but ultimately the kids have to play the game. Our role as parents is to help our children excel and make good progress by collaborating without pressure. The idea is to encourage them to take ownership as this helps them to build confidence and begins to develop their personal skills which creates resilience even at a young age. Helping them learn to about finance instead of teaching them. Coaching kids on financial exercises is age-related and I'll suggest we begin from 5 years plus, but children all learn in different ways depending on your child's maturity level. Some earlier than others but you know your child better than anyone, so you'll know when you can begin. In the following chapters, we begin to explore money language for kids, coaching methods, activities, and tools to equip our young kids with. Money skills for little kids. What is money? The first step is coaching our children about money and helping them understand what money all is about. Money is a medium of exchange that people use to engage in transactions for goods and services. We can begin by allowing our children to handle money both in notes and coin. This can enable them to become familiar with money and its use. How does money work? Explaining to our young kids where money comes from and how it works. Banks create around 80% of money in the economy as electronic deposits. Banknotes and coins only make up 3% of exchange transactions. Most banks have an account with a central bank that is Bank of England. This allows them to transfer money back and forth. Money comes from us working or rendering a service to others. Explain to your kid that we need to work, create or deliver services to make money. In the simplest way, showing our kids what we do for work can also help their understanding. Talk about different jobs people do to earn money. When we visit kids' gymnastics classes and have to pay afterwards, I explain to my kid that the instructor has to be paid by the parents for teaching their children. The instructors have spared her time and passed on her skills and deserves to be paid. Another idea is explaining how musicians create lovely music that we love. The artist has spent their time composing beautiful songs for us to listen to. In return for this service we pay them by purchasing their music for our listening pleasure. As parents, we shouldn't leave the burden upon school teachers because the primary goal of most schools is their syllabus, maths not money. Parents should begin to take advantage of everyday teachable money moments. Let's explore some money skills for young kids. 15 Money Activities for Kids Money Activity 1. Cash Handling Buying toys, visiting McDonald's, or going to the cinema all cost money. Money is used to get what we want in all the places mentioned, so, next time your kid points to an item in the shopping mall and they want you to make an unplanned purchase, go ahead and ask them for some money from their savings to complete their desired purchase. This is a sure-fire way to start up a conversation after they've given you a stare or guilt tripped you by crying their innocent eyes out. Either way, herein lies an opportunity for subtle coaching to begin. Give them the opportunity to use some of your cash to pay the cashier. Let them handle the transaction and feel the surge of confidence from the experience. Their involvement in these basic money situations can have a positive impact and enable them to have a positive relationship with money. Money Activity 2. Playing fun money games with the family. Children playing games is one of the easiest ways to get their attention for long periods. We live in an era where online and video games dominate, but when it comes to learning about money ideally, we want them to learn more about games like Monopoly or MoneyWise Kids instead of Roadblocks or Fortnite. Monopoly is easily one of my favorites because it has various crucial gems within the game like cash flow management, investing, buying the right kind of assets, budgeting, negotiating, learning how location can differentiate good from bad assets. It generally encourages lots of discussions over money and kids also get to handle some notes. Money Activity 3 A visit to the bank with your kid Pay a visit to your local bank so your child can learn about money activities that goes on in a bank. This always leads to questions being asked by young kids. Go online to YouTube library and search for kids' video about banks and what they do. Watch the videos with your child a few times and write down the list of questions your child asks about money and banks that is, who gets to be a banker? And why do we trust banks with our money? Explain the responsibilities of a bank manager, activities that goes on in the bank, how interest is applied to our savings, and how you can withdraw cash. 
One weekend, make arrangements to take your kid to visit your local bank. Deposit some money into your account and explain to your kid the reason why it is that way. They would be amazed to see all they've learned unfolding right before their eyes and would have a greater clarity about the flow of money. Money Activity 4. Creators Not Competitors. Coaching children to learn how to make money is a good thing and we also discuss it in later topics. I believe it's never too early to teach our children how to make money. If they're old enough to spend money, they are certainly old enough to learn how to earn it. But I don't fully subscribe to only using the historic style of paying kids for doing their household tasks. On a personal note, I believe kids should be encouraged to partake in household chores without getting paid for it. Working around the house helps our children to learn about responsibility and the importance of contribution to the greater good. I subscribe to paying kids for their creative endeavors instead of chores. I'll rather kids be creative and help them discover fun and effective ways to earn money. I would pay my little one commissions for writing a poem or a short story, communicating in a foreign language, or building a castle from cardboard boxes. I want to promote the entrepreneurial spirit within kids instead of coaching them to be employees from an early age. Money Activity 5 Create Three Little Piggies Savings, Spending and Giving Helping our young children to become money-wise is a very valuable tool that parents can instill in their young kids. Using the Three Musketeers approach, spend, save and give, is to have financial skills for life. Young kids can learn the basics of budget and also have fun with it. Our role is to help them learn how to save, spend, and give wisely. Personal finance is not something our kids can learn overnight. It takes years to develop good money management skills, but the earlier young children are exposed to finances, the more comfortable and knowledgeable they'll be handling money as adults. This is a simple three-jar process that introduces our children to basic money concepts. My suggestion for younger children is to illustrate the concept of budgeting by labeling all three piggy banks with names of their choice. Money Activity 6. All parents should get life insurance. All parents should look to protect their family with sound financial planning and put an insurance program in place, most especially parents with young kids. Growing up in my community, quite a high number of adults frowned upon the idea of having a life insurance program set up. Some even got scared when life insurance policies were mentioned. Others complained about the cost of the premiums, whilst some did not even want to entertain the idea that we would all cross over to the great beyond one day. In the unfortunate death of a parent, life insurance can protect our legacy and also ensure our kids are well catered for, from education costs, mortgage payments and all other bills. Let's assume a parent passes away and their family receives a £400,000 death benefit, their dependents could use the money to set up a business, make investments and build long-term wealth. Parents don't have to pay huge premiums for whole-of-life insurance policies. We can set up a term life insurance policy which gives us adequate coverage till our kids become adults, that is setting up a term life insurance policy for 30 years. In addition, there is a significant difference in premiums when setting up a term life insurance policy. Parents should at least consider setting up a term policy. The money saved from opting out of a whole life policy can be invested elsewhere. Money Activity 7 Blue Piggy Savings the habit of saving is itself an education. It fosters every virtue, teaches self-denial, cultivates the sense of order, trains to forethought, and so broadens the mind. T.T. Munger Savings Even as adults, we can sometimes be impulsive and tempted to spend our savings, but discipline is what separates us from to those who fail to achieve their financial goals. Remember that spending can sometimes bring temporary gratification, while savings and investments can build long-term wealth and security. Any individual who steadfastly saves a significant part of his earnings will find it easier to acquire more money. Encouraging savings for our young children can be a great help for their future and it encourages them to understand the importance of managing money. Planting the seeds of financial gain in our kids will ensure that they grow up prudent about money. Young kids should start learning with their piggy banks before eventually opening a savings account to begin the compounding process. Point to note. Money is only attracted to the person who would keep and take good care of it and not the spendthrift. Most young children under the age of 10 can't work for an income, 
but they can earn an allowance or commission from parents by completing some simple household tasks as discussed earlier or receive monetary gifts from family members. Commissions earned can then be used as a way to begin their wealth building process. As parents, we can choose family time over the weekend to watch our kids count all their commissions and then split them across their three piggy banks. One third goes toward their own pleasures, red piggy, one third into savings, blue piggy, and one third to the charity jar, yellow piggy. The splits can be done in any variable of their choice with guidance. This method helps them to learn about other uses and importance of money, beyond just buying things for themselves. It begins their early steps into budgeting and money management. But don't just give commissions for the sake of it, allow them to earn it if they want to spend it. In addition, parents should endeavor to pay some monthly interest on their savings, as this is a great way to introduce kids to compound interest. Money Activity 8 Yellow Piggy, Spending Survival is based on spending money on things that you need, not things you don't need because some things can wait until a season of prosperity, Brenda Diane Johnson. Spending Coaching our young kids on how to reasonably spend money empowers them and sharpens their decision-making skills. Responsible adults tend to consider their own spending habits and choices more carefully when spending money they've earned as opposed to money they've been given or one that is lottery winnings. The same applies for children. Kids are perceptive so, when kids have no idea of the responsibilities involved in spending money or purchasing items, they can quickly become carefree and randomly want to purchase everything that sparks their interest. The purpose of using the cash jars to teach money management early is because children will have a hard time understanding the value of money if they've never handled money or have never been taught the budgeting concept. Part of the coaching process for our children involves explaining to them that money is finite, which means that once spent, it's depleted and they would have to earn more before they can spend more. As a result, they begin to learn how to make conscious choices about their spending. You may disagree with your children spending all their cash on Haribo's and Fortnite games, but I also believe that letting them make money mistakes is a part of the learning process to help them get better. There has been so many nightmare stories of young children running up massive bills on their parents' accounts, credit cards or even mobile devices. A five-years-old once ran up a £1,700 bill on the family iPad whilst playing online games within a space of 10 minutes. Another eight-year-old mistakenly spent £1,500 within three days on the family computer device downloading free online games. Good coaching leads to responsible spending habits in kids. It provides clarity that they cannot spend what they do not have. That is the concept of the yellow piggy bank, means that they can't spend more than they have. Money Activity 9. Red Piggy, Giving. Giving liberates the soul of the giver, Maya Angelou. Giving. The importance of giving. Quite simply, our ability to give to others can help to improve the lives of people around us and far away in places we can't even imagine. Our giving can have an impact on so many people across the globe and at the same time have a positive effect on our lives. Once young children start making money, once young children start making money, we can coach them about the importance of giving through contribution or volunteering their time, with the intention of making them aware from a young age that they can make positive changes in the world, by being compassionate. Giving gives us great joy, we feel good when we give and it also teaches our children empathy, it helps young children to understand that not everyone is as fortunate as they are. So, from very early in their lives, being able to assist those in need would immensely boost their confidence and help them to realize a greater sense of their authenticity and growth. We all have something to give, time, money, care, knowledge. For younger children, the greater impact is made when they can actually have a connection or see what impact their contribution is making. For instance, there are numerous charitable projects globally looking to support and help to change the lives of disadvantaged children and young people all over the world. Children can contribute or join a child sponsorship program that may offer an ongoing pen pal relationship with a sponsored child. The long-term impact of this type of giving is positively contagious, as they would grow into adults knowing that they are making a positive difference, pursuing a life of meaning and purpose all starting from the red piggy bank. Money Activity 10 Create a kid's savings account and a goal The financial demands facing our children has never been greater. 
Hence, teaching kids how to save has now become imperative. Teaching our kids to be prudent, by ideally coaching them on the ways of increased income over frugal savings and lowering expenses. By teaching children about the benefit of putting money away regularly, we could get them into the savings habit and instill in them a valuable skill for life. The relative example below just shows a simple accumulation of savings. For example, in the UK, with easy access accounts parents can add money at will and can also easily withdraw it. Yet, due to economic uncertainties, interest rates can change without much notice, so it's important we keep an eye on our kids' account and switch if there's a better deal. In further topics, we would discuss how savings can be taken to the next level with compounding interest. Saving regularly each month can add up over time. Traditional high street bank accounts for kids are usually available from the age of 11. But if you want to start your kids off earlier or want to make sure that they get into good spending habits and have more control over what they use their bank card for, there are a few tools out there that can help. Digital piggy bank accounts. There are numerous cashless piggy banks that allow parents to add money, set limits and monitor transactions, while our kids will be given a bank card and a mobile app which helps them to set up savings goals and manage their balance. You might think, why not just stick with giving my child cash? Doesn't it take away from the charm of pocket money by going digital? But a digital account gives parents the opportunity to keep an eye on where kids are spending their money and to teach them some useful lessons along the way. Let's get into the habit of reviewing their finances regularly with them when appropriate. We can also encourage the use of online banking apps and budgeting tools to stay on track with their spending. As most countries are increasingly becoming cashless societies, parents may also have to adapt to the idea of their kids' online spending. As young children are spending more time online, they are increasingly getting exposed to online gaming. Games where they are regularly expected to make online purchases to get new items or unlock some mystical next stage. Research from the ESA shows that 70% of families have at least one child who plays online video games. Some online games use the freemium model, which means that they give young children some content for free however, for full game features, functions and access, payment is then required. Parents should consider installing a safeguarding system called, Ask to Buy, on the App Store which prevents young kids from making purchases without their parents' consent. Hence next time, your child wants to make an impromptu purchase of a new gaming feature, remind them that they may have to fund the purchase from their blue piggy bank. Money management at work. Some age-appropriate banking apps for kids. Go Henry, a pocket money management tool that helps children and teens learn how to earn, save and spend money responsibly. Children aged 6 to 18 get their very own prepaid Visa debit card, just like a bank card while parents can use the app to manage the account and set spending limits. Osper, a money management option for kids backed by MasterCard. Osper is available for kids aged 8 and upwards and comes with a contactless prepaid card and an app for both your kids and parents to manage. It includes text alerts, card locking for lost cards and spending limits and summary. Nimble, a money management service that comes with a contactless MasterCard and an app. It offers features like instant top-ups, spending limits, instant spending alerts and online statements, payment top-up and a special link to send friends and family who want to give your children money. Rooster Money, a pocket money service for children between the age of 4 to 14. It is currently used by hundreds of thousands of parents and kids. Rooster Money helps children through key milestones in learning about money. Using tools like a star chart in their younger years teaching reward systems, and also introducing a payment card when they're older to teach responsible spending. Money Activity 11. Automating your kids' benefit payment. In the UK, children under 16 qualify for just over £80 PCM in child benefit payments, and children under 20 if they remain in active education. This represents a tax-free payment that is aimed at helping parents cope with the cost of bringing up their children. One parent can claim £20.50 a week for the eldest or only child and £13.55 a week for each of their other children. As parents, we could look to invest this money in a trust fund for our kids in a variety of index funds that own every stock in a particular market, thereby avoiding any sort of concentrated stock risk. 
Or we could consider using ETFs, exchange traded funds. An ETF represent baskets of securities traded on an exchange like stocks. It normally holds assets such as stocks, bonds, currencies and commodities. If you're worried about the returns on your kids' ETF portfolio, you could hedge this risk by adding individual stocks as your kids' portfolio grows. Let's assume that we do nothing and just automated these funds to go into our kids' savings account monthly without any interest. By our kids' 16th birthday, they should have a nest egg of £17,056 or £21,320 by their 20th. Regardless of which mechanism you choose, we should be having a biannual update with our kids showing them their portfolio progression. Also, kindly speak with a professional financial advisor who would ask you detailed questions about your circumstances, your goals and how much risk you are prepared to take with your investment. They may also be able to recommend products that are suitable for you. Money Activity 12 Self-Control and Delayed Gratification Children can often be impatient and emotionally driven to purchase items of their desires immediately, but delayed gratification is a key component of most financially successful people. For young children to learn about delayed gratification, we begin with making them aware that some items are more valuable than others, and some more expensive than others. As parents we can make a mental and written note together with our child as regards how much they have in their savings jar and put that little responsibility on them if they want to spend their savings on their impulse buy. If their savings covers it, fine, they've earned the right to proceed. If it doesn't then they have to continue saving towards their goal or add it to their wish list. Another idea to circumvent impulse purchases might be to get them to delay the purchase for a couple of days to see if they still have the strong desire for the purchase. If they remain patient as discussed, after a couple of days, Reward them with something special and remind them that they earned it because of their patience and trust. As parents, we can play an important role in shaping an environment where our kids focus on the most important item on their wish list and get less distracted by their impulses. Money Activity 13 Credit Credit scoring systems and credit mean very little to children under the age of 10. But we believe it is pivotal that we begin to show our children how it can make a significant difference to them later in later life. Helping kids understand and learn things they should never do and that every credit move they make can make a huge impact on their ability to make major financial decisions in the future. Credit is the amount of money an individual or business has available to borrow based on their financial reputation or credit worthiness. Real Life Credit and Delayed Gratification Lesson Between Mum and Son Sasha Zuger and her son Nikoa. How I taught my son about credit. Shortly after Nikoa's sixth birthday, his mom Sasha took him to a toy store with his $15 gift card that he had received as a gift. They headed straight for the trucks and trains aisle where he spotted a large, shiny construction-themed train set. He threw his arms around the box and told his mom that was his desired toy. Sasha gently pointed out the price tag. It's $69.95, baby. You have only $15. So, she put the toy back on the shelf, and explained to Nakoa that it would take a while for him to save up that much money. He exclaimed to his mom that he could do it, stating that he could save and be patient till he saves up $69.95. Over the coming weeks and months, Nakoa pleaded with his mom Sasha for household chores and different activities combined with an influx of cash from his grandparents for doing well in school till he finally saved up enough money. The D-Day finally arrived, it was finally time to get his train set. Back at the store, Sasha was dismayed to find out all the train sets had been sold out, they were all gone, and the model had been discontinued. There was nothing to be done, the train had left the station. Too devastated even to think about other toys, Nikoa said to his mom, I wish you could just buy things, then pay the money back later. Alas, this planted the seed within Sasha to coach her son about credit considering the fact that she had never learned about finances as a teen herself. Over time, she explained to her son how credit works with real-life examples, by explaining how the bank borrowed her some money to purchase their family car even though she didn't have the cash. The bank lent her the money, because she was considered credit worthy. During coaching, she said, I'd start him at a score of 5, the highest in our new system. If he maintained a 4 or 5, and saw something important to him he couldn't afford, I would extend him a credit line and he could pay me back. 
If he continued to be responsible and repay me promptly, he would stay at five. But if he started pestering me for things, his score would go down, as a real credit score would if you keep requesting higher spending limits. Nikoa was thrilled. The objects of his desire were now within reach. He just had to remember that all his actions affected his score. If we had behavior issues, I might ping his rating down a half point, I explained. If he owed me money but depleted his assets to buy a slushie, it might get lowered again. If he wanted something very pricey, he needed to push his score as high as he could before asking. Nikoa is now older, though trains were long ago replaced by the latest Nike soccer cleats, we still avoid arguments in shops. Sure, clerks sometimes raise an eyebrow when they overhear him say, I can get this, right? My credit score is 4.5, but that's okay. I feel I've helped my son get a head start on money and financial literacy. Money Activity 14 Wants versus Needs Parents should understand and recognize that most kids feel and react to the effects of advertising and peer pressure. Advertising has a pervasive influence on kids. A high number of kids view thousands of ads per year on television, the internet, and even in schools. The result is that they may feel pressured by the ad's psychological techniques that makes them believe they require certain toys or items. It is valuable to explain to our kids that needs come before wants, and sometimes we may have to wait for the things we want, not because we can't afford it but, as we know, impulse purchases is known to be a big cause of many poor financial situations. Like Nikoa, a simple idea can be to create a vision board with our kids. We create two separate columns where our kids can draw or paste all the pictures of their desired wants on the vision board under the want column. Therefore, allowing our kids the chance to independently think about which category fits their considered purchase. This could also be a good exercise in self-determination. Parents can then go ahead and list all the needs that we provide as parents under the need column. That is food, school clothing, toys, entertainment. Now, Let's explain how much money each of their wants would cost and how much savings they would require in achieving this and rank them from highest cost to lowest cost on their vision board. Gradually, we would begin to notice an immediate shift in priorities of their wants. Therein lies another way to introduce their first foundation into savings and foray into the world of economics, as applying this concept to their wants. Decisions would enable them to start making more rational decisions for themselves. What they see as a need now may become a want once a little time has passed for them to get over their emotions, that is choosing between new school shoes over a dollhouse, alternative foregone. As humans, we have a desire to acquire the things that we find desirable. Our emotions can often drive us to make impulse purchases based on our wants. Sometimes acting first then thinking later, it takes discipline to give our purchase decisions a second thought. It is sometimes difficult for adults to make prudent decisions so, you can imagine how much harder it is for children to make a clearer separation of their wants from needs. An easier way to coach our children is to get more specific on their purchase decision. On family shopping trips, the eyes of most kids light up. They would push, cry and plead to get everything they can get away with. As parents, a way to avoid this is to agree beforehand on their purchase decision before going in store and then stick to the plan. If there is a shift in the initial purchase plan, then we can use the alternative foregone strategy again or just say no. We are coaching them to let them understand that it's not okay to always buy on impulse. Money Activity 15 Independent Kids Coaching our kids to be independent Every kid has a superpower seed inside of them waiting to be discovered and nurtured to help them fulfill their potential in life. In many ways, coaches bring out the best of athletes, and helping them compete at their best and highest levels. With our children, we serve as the coach, they can still be considered children but will soon become much more independent and able to handle certain responsibilities with minimal adult supervision. It would be remarkable if we begin to nurture, coach, and support them from an early age using our coaching techniques to enable them to become independent thinkers. We have discussed a few strategies that helps and coaches on how to build their confidence. Allowing our children to make small constructive choices daily can also give them a sense of control. So, how can we coach our kids to be independent thinkers, to think big, to question things that they don't understand, to reach their own conclusions, to believe in their abilities, 
to challenge the norm, to negotiate, to have multiple pictures when analyzing any situation, give them the power of choice. The true power of choice comes from the ability to make a choice, good, bad, or indifferent. Most parents give and impose their orders. Do this or do that. Only few are often open to engaging discussions especially with their younger kids but by building small choices into their daily routine, we are coaching our children on how to be an active part of their decision-making process and thereby allowing them to learn various ways to manage both decisions and their outcomes. Therein lies a lesson within every choice, for example, making young children handle the responsibility of their fair share of chores around the family home fosters a sense of contribution and responsibility, we can explain to them why. In this sense, our children have an understanding of their choice and actions which is, everyone contributes in the home to make it habitable and warm. Whilst explaining the consequences of a bad choice, these habits would teach our children from early on how to negotiate, use leverage and understand consequences. This also teaches them to be creative and think outside the proverbial box. Esther Wojcicki, the mum of successful entrepreneurs and executives stated, I spoke to my daughters as adults from day one. I trusted them and respected the individuality. I wanted more than anything to make them into independent and empowered children and ultimately independent adults. I figured that if they could think on their own and make sound decisions, they could face any challenges that came their way. This certainly served her well and validated her choices as her children grew up to become super successful adults. Summary No one gets rich spending more than they make. When young kids begin to understand concepts such as savings, choice, interest and credit, they would be better equipped to make major financial decisions later in life. If our kids are to fully participate in society, financial literacy is crucial. People have several financial interactions each day, whether it's through earning, spending, or saving money or just making a choice. The earlier we expose our children to financial concepts, the more comfortable and knowledgeable they'll be handling money as an adult. Furthermore, as we begin to raise independent kids, let us listen more to our kids and their ideas, let's encourage more open questions from them and provide them with the assurance of our attention. Chapter 10. Helping our kids unlock their potential. Every parent and guardian should nurture their child's potential by providing them a good environment, provide them a platform to express themselves, and all the necessities that they need to unlock their true potential, but be aware that every child develops in different stages so you don't expect too much or too little from them. Bill was brought up on a council block in Peckham, London, where he lived with his parents as the second of three boys. Growing up, Bill fondly remembers his favorite game was to sit on a seesaw in their local council playground. He loved the bliss of going up and feeling on top of the world and he also enjoyed the adrenaline of going down. It was when he arrived into adulthood that he recognized the seesaws of his childhood as a metaphor for his life. His family was on very low income in their council flat, and it was always him and his brothers that shared all that their parents could provide. It was always up and down, always back and forth, and always a give and take between want and needs. The fun times though were in the winter months, when the brothers had to wear multiple clothings on top of each other in their flat as their parents couldn't afford to leave the heating on for more than one hour at night. Bill had two brothers, John and Andrew. His parents named him Bill, which they thought would give him power and authority like his grandfather that died as a recognized hero in World War II. Bill was barely six when his parents started going through a really tough financial situation that only worsened over the years. Unlike many couples who go through difficult patches or separations in their marriage, they promised to stay together mainly because of their children but, it wasn't without its challenges. His father Samuel was a hard-working man who comes from a line of hardy, hard-working people, and never takes anything for granted. He also believed that men shouldn't cry. He knew the belief was outdated but, was afraid that if he ever showed any signs of weakness, he wouldn't be leaving a good legacy for his sons. Sam didn't have a good relationship with money and his pessimism was accurate. He thought money was bad, the rich were evil and the poor were more spiritual. Those kinds of thoughts kept him financially handicapped. Bill's mom was called Sue, a really kind woman who kept their family together, and was always a ray of wholesome sunshine, using comedy as a coping mechanism to create warmth in their home while also keeping her children happy. They made quite a pair, 
but despite their obvious economic condition, both parents tried to collaborate to put basic tools in place for their children, mostly on the value of education, adaptability, problem solving, and confidence. Sue grew up in an era where she had been taught all her life to be financially dependent on her husband. Most young kids are always happy as they can hardly tell whatever circumstance or obstacles their parents are experiencing. Bill fondly remembers that his parents always made emphasis on the value of education from a young age, which was mainly because they didn't have that much formal education themselves. Their home was a learning school and true education began there for him. His parents had a positive approach towards education and were constantly emphasizing how important it was for the boys in their future endeavors. Despite their obstacles with regards to finances, his parents always stated everyone has an equal chance at success with good education. They found their power in focusing on something more important, their sons, Bill, Andrew, and John. Early on, to prevent the young boys from turning the house upside down, they were taught efficient ways of making decisions and solving problems. Few examples included stopping them from feeling pressured by the things other kids had but rather they focus on how to make the right choices about what they could have or can't have. Their form of discipline was also constructive and consistent. Sam and Sue tried their best to make sure that the boys had everything they needed, even if that meant making the boys understand at an extremely young age that it wasn't the same as having everything they wanted, but it mattered more. It started with little things his parents did, so that they wouldn't have to even face the world poor. Sometimes they made sure that he had money in his pockets, despite encouraging him, a little too emphatically, to avoid spending it. Bill's parents made sacrifices for him. Every parent does that for their children, but there was just an extra layer to it that only working-class parents seemed to understand. They made sure Bill got new clothes to wear on his birthday, even if his father had to wear the same suit to every work event for an embarrassingly long time. They always had snacks for the boys at home even when Sue had to give up smoking to save money. The efforts of his parents were rewarded with his happiness. In all honesty, whilst his parents couldn't afford them the best diet, Bill was always looking forward to having his free school meals after their predictable daily oatmeal breakfast at home. He also loved escaping the confines of their small flat by immersing himself into school. As soon as he started school everyone immediately started calling him Billy. He was always telling jokes that he picked up from his mom. There was always that bright smile on his face. He carried himself well. He wasn't rough like some other kids, but he was far from pristine. Bill was an unstoppable force though, even as a kid. In his style he resembled a shooting star, always moving and always bright. He might have been a little clumsy, but he made up for it tenfold with how easygoing and charming he was from the beginning. Quite early, his parents noticed that he was a very sociable and high-energy kid, so they helped to focus his talents on his strong points and talents helping him to build his self-esteem and unlocking full potential by constantly encouraging him and his brothers to be confident in themselves, pursue success and always aim high in life. Most evenings, their family time was spent recapping what they learned as school, completing their schoolwork and watching The Good Life on BBC a comedy series based on self-sufficiency casted in the UK in the early 70s. Just before beginning high school, his parents still couldn't afford a decent or metaphorical scarf. Financially the family were still helplessly swinging back and forth, his parents eventually separated. Sue got invited to a weekend retreat by a local friend where she had stumbled across NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, and also became a fervent student of the laws of attraction. She had a few revealing NLP sessions where she realized that her perception of the world is distorted and limited. She always knew that there was something missing in their lives, the freedom that wealth creates, and she would frequently ask herself, when did the rich realize they were rich? Do they always know? Do their parents explain it to them as children? Do they find out later in life? She wondered because her experience as a kid from a poor family herself wasn't strikingly different to what she was experiencing as a single mom. She found out what being poor was while being too young. Not only that, it was something she needed to know and to understand, so she could make sense of her life. Her parents never taught her the value of money. Sue made up her mind that she'd had enough. Something had to change. She stopped whining about her situation and started taking necessary action. 
She applied for numerous jobs and finally won as a teaching assistant and began to coach her young sons on positive thinking, money, and attracting wealth in all areas of their lives. She believed money something you worked for, it wasn't everything, but it could certainly make life easier if intelligently implemented. She drew upon her power and resolution and taught them about kindness. It was not about having people that owe you favors, and it was not about expecting something in return. She taught them they had to learn to share with each other and also help those in need. Even though she initially deeply wished she didn't have to, she taught her sons the meaning and the difference between being wealthy and poor, and she had to explain to them where the family stood. It was her honesty, love, coaching, humility, and especially her hope that really ended up shaping the person Bill and his brothers turned out to be as adults. In a few short years, Sue began to earn a very decent income and had been promoted a few times before becoming a head teacher at a respectable school. Bill developed a mind for business and comedy. Sue noticed he was particularly fascinated by the art of business and media. She encouraged him to further pursue his interest, gain more knowledge and signed him up for a few business apprenticeships. Bill was retained after one of his apprenticeship and now currently runs a six-figure business in the UK whilst also being successful with his comedy club. His brothers are also successful and self-sufficient. Andrew is a finance director with a charitable firm involved with helping to alleviate child poverty. John also works as an engineer and is happily married. Every quarter, Sue celebrates their successes and achievements by organizing family gatherings to catch up, share family time, ideas, success stories and make them feel good about themselves. Still providing them with positive reinforcements and reminding them to assist others as well. Reflecting on how Sue was able to influence her children's outcome as adults, Bill states that there are so many things parents can do to ensure the success of their child. Some of the tips below can help your child and help them fulfill their potential. Summary 1. Parents can be financial role models for their young kids regardless of their past relationship with money. They can show them, coach them, budget with them, teach them to set small and reasonable goals, and help them move towards their goals one step at a time. 2. Affirmations for young kids can help to enhance their self-esteem, build their confidence and enhance their positive self-talk. Thoughts become things and using the power in our thoughts constructively can propel us. Kids having positive thoughts about most things is imperative, even about finances. 3. Today more than ever, the world needs strong parents to teach their kids financial well-being and independence. We all have the ability to recover from setbacks, and overcoming setbacks also helps us build their confidence. It can help kids also to build their resilience to bullying and other negative life situations. Chapter 11. Why Kids Should Invest Early. Being rich is having money. Being wealthy is having time. Margaret Bonanno. One of the greatest gift parents can leave their kids would be to teach and show them how to make money. Life is like a game of Monopoly, and the person who makes the most money usually has the best investments. The best investment we can make is in ourselves. In this case, our children are the best investment but the goal here is to invest in our kids to enable them to attain clear financial literacy skills, confidence and wealth by the time they become adults. According to a 2018 T. Rowe Price survey of more than 1,000 young adults, ages 18 to 24, 30% said that it wasn't until they turned 15 that their parents taught them about money. And of that group, 82% said they mostly learned about how to save and be frugal. I believe that, while it is important to teach kids how to save, it is even more important to teach them how to invest. Saving is important but we should set an example for our kids by emphasizing the importance of knowing how to invest and grow their money. Investing can also be fun. With global interest rates at an all-time low, strictly focusing only on saving money is the recipe to the downfall of most savers. Inflation today has led to several savers actually losing money because of solely focusing on saving. History has shown us investment works in tandem with time. Investing early for children means time will do all the compounding and heavy lifting. Money invested multiplies at a given rate every year. Whilst investments made today won't get them wealthy tomorrow but the sooner they begin, the better the rewards long term and the more secure your child's future will be financially. Benefits of investing early. Think of saving for your short-term goals. Think of investing for your long-term goals. 
Anne Ackerley. We've all heard the phrase, fail to plan, plan to fail. Italian-American Nobel Prize winner and economist, Franco Modigliani stated that he'd always thought that the wealth in society had been accumulated not by people like us, but by the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the kings and queens of England, who left it to their heirs. There is some validity to this statement, but the truth is that anyone can become wealthy provided they have a plan and diligently make that plan work. One's earnings should be viewed in an aggregate that will start small and grow over time during our working or earning life. During the earning years, we should consume, save, and invest so that the limited earning years provides a lifetime of resources to spend. Investing early is clearly an excellent and proven way to build compounding wealth. Working with percentages, we'd stipulate coaching children using the legendary Jim Rohn's simple 70, 10, 10, 10 strategy. It's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts and starting young certainly helps. Let us coach our children not to eat the goose that lays the golden eggs. The special goose has to be properly taken care of and nurtured regularly so it can continue to produce for us. 70. Don't spend more than 70% of every one pound you earn. Spending. 10. Give 10% of every one pound you earn to charitable work. Giving. 10. Put aside at least 10% in active investments for profit. That is, business. 10. Save 10% for passive investment. That is bank interest, child ISA, fixed deposits, savings. Ultra-wealthy individuals are always looking for ways to double or triple their income so they can enjoy the good life. After saving, they invest the remainder of their money into instruments like stocks, bonds, and real estate. I interviewed some of my wealthy, successful clients and mentors for the purpose of this book, and one thing they all have in common is that they see money as a dynamic medium of exchange for goods and services that should be used intelligently, circulated and made to work for you and they pass that point of view on to their kids by teaching them to invest their money. Savings is like putting your money to rest, whilst investing is putting your money to work. Research survey of 1,000 parents, conducted for this book show over 70% of parents intend to use their property portfolios as an investment vehicle for their kids. I actually believe it is a very good idea because property tends to appreciate in value over time. It can also generate cash flow if used for rental, and also increase in significant equity over the years it takes our children to become adults. The only issue with that is like with most investments, if the housing market or economy fluctuates significantly, there is no guarantee you'll be able to sell your home or refinance to tap into its equity. So, whilst being a great idea, I'll suggest we have a degree of diversification and also consider keeping our kids' future investments in a trust. Investments for our kids should be planned as long-term investments. We should be prepared to hold them for at least 10 years or more. Chapter 12. Teaching your kids how to make money. Teach the kids. They need to learn how to handle, grow and multiply money. It's basic and should be taught at an early stage. Bo Sanchez. Stocks. Stock markets are cyclical, and the 2020 stock market crash is a testament to that concept. Stocks can provide the basis of a lifelong investment habit, but do bear in mind the value of investments and income from them may fall as well as rise over time, and investors may not get the full amount invested. As parents, we can use simple stocks to introduce our children to investing. Stocks can be easy to explain to kids if we use companies our children have an affinity with. Companies like their favorite toy company, sports, drinks. My favorite quote for the stock market is, if you're not using a professional investment manager, then only buy shares in companies you understand. Watch YouTube video, Jeff Rose coaching his young children on how to invest in stocks. Jeff Rose, yes, even kids can invest in the stock market. Real estate. There are several ways to make the concept investing exciting and relatable in a fun way for young kids. As discussed in previous chapters, Monopoly is a great way for introducing children to real estate in a passive way, as well as teaching them some basic investment principles like strategic locations, investments, cash flow, paying their due bills to utility companies, collecting rent and more. As with parents in the survey, this is a strategy I like because of the less cyclical nature of real estate assets compared to other asset classes. 
Watch YouTube video. Paul Smith coaching his young son on how to invest in the UK property market. UK. Paul Smith. How an 11-year-old can buy property. Selling old toys. Most young kids receive scores of toys all the time. Birthdays, Christmas, parties, endless toys used only a couple of times and then dumped in storage, under the bed or in a loft somewhere. Many of these unused toys can often be worth a decent amount of cash, and cash is king at this age because it is tangible and shows the exchange of money for goods, especially when it involves selling items like toys and books that our kids may no longer want or need. This can also present an opportunity to go full circle on financial literacy. Instead of binning the items, search online on eBay for the toys you want to sell. Check out descriptions and conditions to give you an idea how much your kids can sell theirs for. You can also see how much other similar toys have sold for. List the items with them, and get them to calculate how much they could gain after selling fees and postage costs. The profit realized can provide an outlet for their first investment seed. This could also open their mind to the world of business. Teach them at a young age to protect their wealth from loss. Lessons from the richest man in Babylon. Our kids should be taught that they need to learn how to protect their savings. When they reach an investing age, their initial foray should be invested only where their money is safe and can get back a fair interest. The lesson is to invest only with experts or trusted firms. Beware of these other ways of losing the money you've saved that is, spending it on wants rather than needs. Succumbing to a bogus get-rich-quick scheme. Investments that you haven't researched properly and fails to pay off. Loaning it to family and friends who don't repay you. They hardly ever repay and could lead to unwanted disputes. Summary. Note. It's important to note that one of the greatest benefits of kids starting younger is that they can afford to make mistakes along the way as they have the benefit of time to stumble a few times, recover and continue learning and eventually become wealthy with the help of experience gathered along the way. Chapter 13. Financial Positivity. Being rich is a good thing. Not just in the obvious sense of benefiting you and your family, but in the broader sense. Profits are not a zero-sum game. The more you make, the more of a financial impact you can have. Mark Cuban. We've all made wrong money decisions even as parents some, more than others. But, looking forward we should try to make positive changes by showing ourselves a bit of financial self-care. We can actually work on making ourselves feel good about the money we make and spend by focusing positively on ourselves and our relationship with money. What do I mean? Whatever we embody, our kids will learn and emulate them. What we think and say about money has a corresponding effect on what happens in both our lives and children's. Money should be used as a tool and a good thing. Our mentality towards money can be construed with an affinity for the positive and also help build resilience against money setbacks. Whist coaching our kids on financial literacy, we should try not to overwhelm them with information, keep it age-specific and fun. More importantly, as parents, we should try not to use negative money talk in our conversations with our kids, but instead realign our thought process to enable us to attract success and abundance. To do this I'll suggest, in our money-related conversations with our kids that we constantly use positive affirmations, relatable actions and positive money mantras. If parents consistently give kids positive messages about money, this will become their new normal and you can watch them take off to greater heights. Examples below. Before and after. Money doesn't grow on trees. Money flows freely to me. Money is the root of all evil. Money is only a tool and our use of it reflects our values. Money can't buy happiness. Whoever said money can't buy happiness isn't spending it right. It's hard to make money. Earning money is easy for me. Too much money is bad. I love money. Money is good. Summary. Let's admit it. Having money doesn't guarantee us a good life. But not having money almost certainly creates a lot of barriers for most people. Financial positivity can help create financial self-confidence in our kids therefore positively creating an expectation of a positive outcome. Most young children have not conformed to the way of the world yet. Their minds are free like a soaring eagle sunbathing in the sky. So, building their financial self-confidence can actually be one of our easiest tasks of all. Everything is achievable with effort, 
persistence, working cooperatively, and having a goal in mind. Chapter 14. Learning and Reading. The game of life is the game of everlasting learning. At least it is if you want to win, Charlie Munger. Reading is important. Reading to our kids at an early age can inspire them to start reading themselves. Once the reading habit is developed, it can enable kids to enjoy reading well into adulthood. Reading can help with intellectual plus cognitive stimulation and is also a great way to improve kids' vocabulary, communication skills, and literacy skills. More importantly, an investment in knowledge is forever invaluable to our kids. U.S. neurologist, Ben Carson shared a story about a parenting rich habit that he learned from his mom in his best-selling book, One Nation. Dr. Carson once lived in one of Detroit's impoverished areas in the United States. His mom was afraid that her son would become just another casualty of his environment. To prevent this, Mrs. Carson made her young son Ben read every day for self-education. To ensure her son did his daily reading she also required that he write a page summary about what he read that day so she could read it. Each day, young Ben would hand this summary to his mom for her to review. This daily reading eventually became a habit that helped give Ben the confidence to pursue higher education and eventually medical school. He continues to read every day and has achieved so much. He is an American politician, author, and retired neurosurgeon. Doctors at the Cleveland Clinic recommend that parents begin to read with their children as early as infancy and should continue through elementary school year, as reading with your children builds warm and happy associations with books. Further research by Professors Cunningham and Stanovich shows that reading yields significant dividends for everyone, not just for the smart kids or the more able readers. Even children with limited reading and comprehension skills can build vocabulary and cognitive structures through reading. Kids who read a lot will enhance their verbal intelligence. That is, reading will make them even smarter. So, an early start in reading is important in predicting a lifetime of literacy experience, level of reading comprehension ability and individual attainment. Summary The simplest way to make sure that we raise literate children is to teach them to read, and to show them that reading is a pleasurable activity. Neil Gaima Chapter 15 Incorporating Early Maths If I were again beginning my studies, I would follow the advice of Plato and start with mathematics. Galileo Galilei A 2007 meta-analysis of 35,000 preschoolers across the U.S., Canada, and England found that developing math skills early can turn into a huge advantage for kids. I've always believed math is an important part of learning for children especially in the early years because it provides them with vital life skills. How many times have you heard older students state their dislike for mathematics? I'm willing to bet at least a dozen times. The truth is maths will help children solve problems, measure and develop their own spatial awareness. According to top economist, Greg Duncan, mastery of early math skills predicts not only future math achievement, it also predicts future reading achievement. Early math skills have the greatest predictive power, followed by reading and then attention skills. Part of Greg Duncan's research discusses the correlation between early math adoption and later success. Part of his study supports the conclusions that math and reading skills at the point of school entry are consistently associated with higher levels of academic performance in later grades. Making maths fun. Children who dislike maths should not be ignored but instead taught better math skills and should be given materials they find interesting so they can learn to like to maths and see it as a solvable puzzle. We can start with 10 minutes a day of fun exercise. One of the best ways for parents to build math's confidence in their children is to infuse math in the routines of their daily life, either as games or as entertaining ways to solve problems. I normally randomly just ask my little kid 520 plus 101 or any other combination and watch her scribbling in her diary, whilst also engaging her brain to solve the puzzle. Indian-based maths teacher Deborati stated, playing with numbers is an art. She explains that math provides passion. Since it's an art, once you get it, the thrill of solving the mystery behind those numbers is never ending. You just can't get enough of it. It instigates passion and excitement in children that paves a way for passionate adults. Making math a fun and important part of kids' lives improve their confidence in various other things as well. Basically, it just makes them proud. Chapter 16 
Why kids should dress well. You can have anything you want in life if you dress for it. Edith Head. Appearance is important. First impressions and all that, I'm sure you've heard them all. Regardless of the occasion, dressing appropriately is one of the easiest ways to create a good impression and get off to a good start. We as human beings form pictures in our minds very quickly. These pictures allow us to assess every circumstance internally before externally. Studies show 55% of another person's perception of you is based on how you look and remember. First impressions are lasting impressions. Perception can be hard to shake off once formed. Ever notice how when someone dressed very well approaches you for help, you take out the time to help them? You do this because they look presentable. Presentable equals seemingly respectable. Flip the situation around and someone dressed shoddy approaches you or walks into your office. Your first impression is, are you at the right place or are you talking to me? We evaluate people whom we have just met based on their appearance. Whether we agree or not, most times we are addressed because of the way we dress. We can start helping our kids dress well from a young age, looking sharp, good hygiene, smelling nice. Something as little as learning how to knot a tie can make a huge difference. Growing up, I saw my dad leaving our home most mornings and decades later, I still have vivid pictures in my head of his routine. Shaving cream on his face, clean shave, ties on the side, shoes being polished, crisp white shirt and suits to match. Fast forward a few years, I seem to have subconsciously picked it all up. Looking smart always, ties done up, polished shoes, looking presentable and respectable. Research into the impact of clothes on behavior now suggests that there may actually be a grain of truth in these sayings. Science says that the clothes we wear affect our behavior, attitudes, personality, mood, confidence, and even the way we interact with others. A paper in August 2015 in Social Psychological and Personality Science asked subjects to change into formal or casual clothing before cognitive tests. Wearing formal business attire increased abstract thinking, an important aspect of creativity and long-term strategizing. The experiments suggest the effect is related to feelings of power. For young kids, getting well-dressed is never an easy task. Hence, we should endeavor not to lose patience. We can show them by putting on our own clothes and ask them to mirror our steps. Chapter 17. Taking Responsibility. Don't handicap your children by making their lives easy. Robert A. Heinlein. Responsible young kids are empowered with clear instructions but also trusted enough to enable them sort out things on their own. Children taking responsibility is a good character trait. Children are leaders of tomorrow so, even whilst young, allowing children to make some of their own decisions is vital, as it fosters a sense of responsibility that gives them a sense of pride. Striking the right balance between managing all their affairs for them, allowing enough freedom or underparenting is an everyday creative task for parents. According to mental health counselor Laura J.J. Dessauer, not allowing our children to make decisions can eventually turn them into codependent adults. She suggested that making every decision for a child, including the clothes they wear, exactly when they do their homework, and who they can play with, can eliminate their desire to make their own decisions. As they grow older, they are likely to seek out relationships in which someone else has all the power and control. If we want our children to become creative, innovative problem solvers, we would need to give them opportunities to deal with complex issues, struggle with them, play with them and have the time and the support to come towards a solution. It is often said that self-responsibility is the true defining attribute to qualify as an adult. In our experience as parents, we may have come across some adults that lack this key trait, that is they struggle to make concise decisions, they don't follow instructions, they miss deadlines, always late to appointments, handle their finances poorly, regularly shabbily dressed. To prepare our young kids for the future, and help them become responsible adults who can deal with the realities of adulthood, we can begin coaching them very early on good life skills, that is children under 10 knowing how to make their morning cereal, having their own baths unaided, getting dressed for school, clearing their own dishes after meal. Parents can set reasonable behavior expectations and you'll be surprised how quickly kids can get into good routines with a bit of coaching and encouragement. Chapter 18. Debt. D. Do not. E. Enter. B. 
before t thinking quite a few people are willing to enter into debt without getting full clarity of all the risks involved once you start becoming nonchalant about debt and start falling behind it can quickly begin to spiral out of control late payments defaults county court judgments bankruptcy the negative impact of debt on families should never be underestimated bad debt has torn apart the fabric of many families it has a way of influencing the beholder's mindset to feel less than they truly are this is because uncontrolled bad debt can quickly become corrosive making the debtor lose self-confidence and feel like they are spiraling out of control and this could make them prisoners of circumstance. Lots of experts advocate teaching kids to never use debt. Whilst I understand their point of view, I believe we should coach our young kids on debts, different types of debts, and help them understand the risks of using too much debt. Research conducted by the Children's Society also found that children growing up in families in debt are five times more likely to be unhappy, than those in families without debt troubles. Debt can be a financial noose around our neck. We cannot build true wealth if we are saddled with bad debts that are mostly connected with liabilities. Hence, it is fundamental to educate our kids early by teaching them the basics of money, depending on their age of course as children mature at different rates, but one of the best things any parent can do to help young kids learn about the concept of debt, lending, credit and how it all works is to begin early and gradually. There are lots of adults walking around society in their 30s, 40s, maybe even older who still don't really know anything about money. Coaching our children on money, debt, credit, and investments might initially be a challenge, but it is worth the effort in the long run. There is so much uncertainty in the world that it is almost inevitable hence. It makes sense to begin early by teaching them habits that'll certainly help their financial future. I believe raising and coaching our children to be prudent with money is a very responsible thing to do on the part of parents. Most parents want their kids to succeed and not become a victim of debt. But this will remain just wishes until we take control of their attitude towards money from a young age, so they never have to find themselves in an uncontrollable bad debt situation. As parents, we can have a positive effect on our child's financial outlook by positively talking about money, explaining to them why we made an investment decision showing the assets and liabilities in real time, whilst also demonstrating good money behaviors life. Our kids are much quicker to pick up on our actions. The tools we have discussed thus far in this book should equip young kids to make the right judgment. In the mid-2000s, as a teenager, one of my best friend's dad was fairly successful in the advertising industry. He had his own office building and a few contracts with record labels at that time. He had given up his job and started off his business with his office in a prime location in the city. Things were looking up for his family back in those days. They had nice cars, a decent house and numerous credit card companies sending 0% cards with unlimited offers of credit. Flowing with the time, he bought both his city office buildings and home on 0% mortgages as they were readily available back then. The office building cost was £560,000 and the home was just under £300,000. At that time, I spent numerous weekends at their home watching movies or on the PlayStation with my pal. His dad was certainly in his element, he was successful in the community, making his dream a reality, weekend vacations to Italy or Spain. The economic performance at that time, actually felt like it was booming, high employment levels, the expansion of property and the public sector all felt very positive. Gradually, he continued to work on his new business trying to get the company up and running but for most months they had numerous expenses and very little capital left over after paying their employees and contractors. Then, within two years, there was a nationwide financial crisis that occurred between 2007 and 2010, and it contributed to both the UK and US financial crisis. There was a huge decline in property prices and value knocking off as much as 20%. The recession followed suit, which led to cut downs in household spending and then business investments. Most investors pulled out of the market and everyone started tightening purse strings. His business hit a significant drop as most corporates had no allocation to pay for advertising, yet the office and home mortgage and loan repayments were still significant, about £5,000 a month that irregular flow of business wasn't good either. Within a few months, he had to let go of most of his staffs as couldn't afford to pay them any longer. 
the offices or house couldn't be refinanced either as they both now had significant negative equity. My friend started getting glimpses of a barrage of red letters of missed mortgage payments, numerous calls on their landline at odd hours from bailiffs. His dad couldn't handle it all, and he wasn't sleeping much, buried his head in the sand and started slipping into depression. The debt was putting immense strain on the family and they were living with constant fear of eviction. Within 13 months and after a few court hearings, the bank's receiver sold off both properties at a significant loss. The family had to move away from the neighborhood and start building their lives again from zero. The good news is even though it took them another decade to get back to some sort of resemblance of the previous life, his dad is now doing well and healthy. The family is more financially prudent and have put in place financial shock absorbers for the future. Ever so often, we learn of families or individuals in financial ruin because they lacked financial literacy, they were never taught in school or had anyone to genuinely guide them. At this juncture, it is important to state that financially savvy adults are aware that not all debt is bad. There is a clear difference between good debt and bad debt. Good debt can be used to solve problems. Good debt is debt that's used to invest in assets, has a longer-term value, potentially puts money in our pocket, and increases our net worth but there's an element of risk in every investment. Bad debt involves borrowing money to purchase depreciating assets, that is cars, electronic gadgets, clothes. If our purchases won't go up in value or generate income, we shouldn't go into debt to buy them. Furthermore, younger kids might struggle with understanding leveraging good debts, so it might be a discussion to be had when they become teenagers, but there's nothing wrong with educating them with the basics early. Learning Activity Suggestions 10 Money Questions for Coaching Children Under 10 What is money? What is debt? Difference between good or bad debt? The difference between assets and liabilities? Give examples of both. What are shares? Who is an entrepreneur? Highlight the difference between a need and a want? What is real estate? What are some ways you can earn money? Can you explain how your parents make money? Can you get anything you want with money? Reading Recommendation for Young Kids A Chair for My Mother by Vera B. Williams A beautifully illustrated book which tells the story of a young girl, her waitress mother and her grandmother who lose everything in a fire. When they move into a new home, the daughter and grandmother save money in a jar in the hope of one day buying a comfortable chair for the girl's hard-working mother. Ultimate Kids Money Book by Neil S. Godfrey, a full compilation kid-friendly and comprehensive guidebook. It includes charts, illustrations, photographs, and sidebars that make it easy to use and fun to read. A great resource for parents who aren't sure where to start when explaining things like credit cards, savings accounts, banks. Money for Beginners by Eddie Reynolds, an informative introduction to the world of money, covering topics including bank accounts, earning and borrowing to government spending, taxes and inflation. With bright, infographic pictures, a detailed glossary and links to specially selected websites where you can visit a virtual bank, see money from around the world and more. Spend It, Money Bunny, by Cinders McLeod. A thrilling money story about Sonny who gets three whole carrots a week for his allowance and wants to buy everything with it. He soon discovers his money won't go that far, and his mom tells him he needs to make some choices. After a little math and a little more thinking, he has a blast discovering what's really important to him and worth spending his carrots on. No Limit Kids How Working Parents Coach Their Young Kids to Become Wealthy Adults Short Author Bio Dasha Dedipe is a parent, investor, author, business and real estate enthusiast. He is currently a corporate business manager for a Fortune 500 company in the City of London. Dash has spent the last decade working in the business and finance industry and has written numerous articles about aspiring always, mindset tools of champions, improving your self-worth, switching disappointment to success. No Limit Kids was designed to help parents coach their young kids on how to manage their finances. As parents, we can enhance the probability of successful financial adult outcomes by taking steps to improve our children's outcomes through helping them understand one of the most important areas in everyone's future, includes money, finance, and wealth.